Right, the first reading is Leviticus chapter 1, verses 3 to 9 on page 102 of the church. If the offering is a burnt offering from the herd, you have to offer a male without defect. You must present it at the entrance to the tent of meeting so that it will be acceptable to the Lord. You are to lay your hand on the head of the burnt offering and it will be accepted on your behalf to make atonement for you. You are to slaughter the young bull before the Lord, and then Aaron's sons, the priests, shall bring the blood and splash it against the side of the altar at the entrance of the tent of meeting. You are to skin the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. The sons of Aaron, the priest, are to put fire on the altar and arrange wood on the fire. Then Aaron's sons, the priests, shall arrange the pieces, including the head and the fat, on the wood that is burning on the altar. You are to wash the internal organs and the legs with water, and the priest is to burn all of it on the altar. It is a burnt offering, a food offering, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. Right. This second reading is Leviticus 5, 13 to 16 on page 105. In this way, the priest will make atonement for them for any of these sins they have committed and they will be forgiven. The rest of the offering will belong to the priest, as in the case of the grain offering. The Lord said to Moses, when anyone is unfaithful to the Lord by sinning unintentionally in regard of any of the Lord's holy things, they are to bring to the Lord as a penalty a ram from the flock, one without defect and of the proper value in silver, according to the sanctuary shekel. It is a guilt offering. They must make restitution for what they have failed to do in regard to the holy things, pay an additional penalty of a fifth of its value and give it all to the priest. The priest will make atonement for them with the ram as a guilt offering and they will be forgiven. And the last reading is Hebrews chapter 10 verses 1 to 10 on page 1208. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshippers would have been cleansed once and for all, and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of their sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you do not desire, you did not desire, but a body you prepared me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. First, he said, Sacrifices and offerings burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire nor were you pleased with them though they were offered in accordance with the law then he said here i am i have come to do your will he sets aside the first to establish the second and by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of jesus christ once for all Thanks, Lynn. Morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Sam. I noticed last week everyone could just see there my my chin on the recording. So that's slightly. It's probably less. Maybe they prefer it. Uh, welcome to week two of our series in Leviticus. Uh, we had a, a sort of introduction last week. Uh, so let me pray as we uh, skip through chapters one to seven, all of our offerings, and see what that has to say for us uh, today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you that all of it, as we thought about last week, is useful for us, for training and righteousness, for uh, rebuking, encouraging, correcting. Uh, we pray that this passage today would show us more of your love through the Lord Jesus. Uh, speak to us by your spirit to our hearts, we pray in his name. Amen. Uh, well, Leviticus, as we learned last week it's on the slide, uh, my summary of it was that the holy God calls his people to be holy 
and provides atonement through sacrifice for when they are not. A holy God calls his people to be holy and provides atonement, uh, a making right, uh, an avoidance of God's wrath uh, through sacrifice for when they are not. Uh, and if you read uh, chapters one to seven of Leviticus uh, this week, I suspect you were struck by the kind of rigorous requirements of all these offerings in these first seven chapters given to God's people three and a half thousand years ago before Jesus came. Uh, there's a lot going on. There's, a, there's five different offerings. There's various instructions. Uh, there's a lot. Uh, one thing that becomes clear, though, given all of that, is that sin is very serious, uh, a rebellion against God, not following his rules. Uh, and also sin is not dealt with easily. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot to do. We've just, if you've read it. And third, our sin requires blood to be shed before God as a punishment for us. So sin is serious. It's not easily dealt with. It requires blood. Uh, and you get that idea as you read through these chapters. And you're probably also were thinking, if you've read it, I am glad I don't have to do all of that now. That would be a lot of work, wouldn't it? We don't have to do such offerings today. Why not? Uh, because we live this side of Jesus' death and resurrection. That's why we had uh, the New Testament readings. Uh, but just because there is a once for all sacrifice in Christ, which I'm about to read from you from Hebrews 1, doesn't mean we totally ignore any sense of sacrifice on offering ourselves to God. And we're going to think about that today. So uh, Hebrews 10 verse 1, we just had it read. The law, so speak of Leviticus, is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. So that they're like a picture or a model of what's to come. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated, repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. The law cannot make us perfect if we want to approach God in worship. Uh, so Leviticus, Hebrews goes on to say, it's like part one of a two-part salvation plan that God has to save his people for himself. So part one, the law will show us our sin. As we read it, we, we see how sinful we are, and it will show us our need for a sacrifice. Something's got to be done between us and God if we're to be in relationship with him. Part two is the fulfillment of this law in the person of Jesus. So have a look, uh, if you're still in Hebrews uh, verses 8 and 10, the last part of that reading, Hebrews 10 verse 8 and 10. Uh, first, he said, sacrifices and offerings, so speaking of what we're looking at today, burnt offerings we're going to look at, and sin offerings we're going to look at, you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law, so it was the right thing to do. Then he said, so Jesus said, here I am, I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first, part one, to establish the second, part two, and by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So part one is important because it shows us our sin, shows us our need for God, shows us how serious sin is. But part two is Jesus comes and fulfills it all for us. So that, that's sort of where we're going today. Jesus is our once for all sacrifice, uh, our once for all offering to make us right and holy in God's sight. So our desire now if it's still to approach and work with God, to draw near, as it's put in uh, Leviticus, uh, our desire hasn't changed. We want to worship him. He is our God. He is the one true God uh, in our world. He's already saved the Old Testament Israelites from slavery in Egypt. And if we believe and repent in Jesus, then he's already saved us from our sins. And so this once for all sacrifice fulfills everything we're about to look at in Leviticus. So the Lord is worthy of worship. He is holy and we are to be holy. That's the call. And so I guess the challenge, and this is what we're going to think on towards the end, uh, is are we determined to worship this one true God? Are we prepared to make the same, uh, the equivalent type of sacrifices and offerings that we see here in Leviticus? I is he worth it? Is sort of the question we are left with as we look through these seven chapters of Leviticus. That was a lot of work, but now he's done more, part two. Are we worth, uh, sorry, is he worth 
our worship and our sacrifice and our offerings today, or the equivalent at least. So uh, let's go through the offerings just to give you some bearings. If you haven't read, if you have read it, or you're, you're going to read it this week, uh, chapters one to six go through these five main offerings and sacrifices that are observed by the Old Testament Israelites. And then in chapter six to seven, those same five are repeated, but they're instructions now to the priests. So the first six chapters, here's what the people do. Then the last two chapters of that section, uh, this is how the priests deal with that. So there's five offerings in total. Number one, then, let's go through it, burnt offerings. Uh, in Numbers 28, uh, there's an expectation that burnt offerings are brought every morning and every evening. These are regular things. Uh, it's, it's common of all the offerings uh, throughout the Old Testament as you read. And a male animal, one without any defects, because only the best will do for God, is to be brought. Uh, and it's important to know that all the way through these offerings, uh, the best sacrifice does not mean the most. The best is not the most. Uh, so allowances are made for people with, le with less wealth, uh, as we see later on in the chapters. In, in other words, God is not interested in what his people, who can bring the most to him. Who's got the biggest cow to bring? That's not what he's interested in. What he's interested in is who can bring their best to him. Uh, just as the poor widow in the New Testament brings her on an only coin and puts it in the offering. And Jesus declares that that one coin is of far greater value than all the coins that the rich people bring, because she's brought the best that she can bring. They've brought the most, but not their best. So she gave the Lord her all. That's the, the, the theme as we look through these offerings. Uh, the burnt offering is uh, sometimes called a whole offering or, or an ascension offering. And that's because the whole animal is brought, the whole animal is burnt on the altar, and the whole aroma ascends to God. This is the big one. Everything goes, uh, apart from the skin, on the altar to be burnt. And it's for the purpose of atonement. We'll think about what that means later. So uh, into Leviticus chapter 1, verse 4, we had this read to us, I think it's on the screen. Uh, let's go through uh, roughly what's happening. Uh, you're to lay your hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it will be accepted on your behalf to make atonement for you. That's the big picture. And the worshipper, the one who approaches, has a lot to do. Uh, they're to slaughter the animal in such a way that the blood can be drained out. That They have to skin it because the skin goes to the priest. They have to chop it up into pieces. And then they have to wash any of the dirty or unclean parts or organs so that when the priest touches them, he isn't defiled by handling them. It is a big and messy job. I don't know if you've seen an animal slaughtered, uh, but it's involved, to say the least. There's a lot going on. Then the priest has the task of taking the blood and sprinkling it on the altar, on the sides. Why? Why the blood? Why is that significant all the way through Leviticus? Uh, well, on the screen is a verse from the chapter 17 of Leviticus, uh, another key verse in the book. For the life of a creature is in the blood. Uh, not literally, it's just what represents life between uh, us and God. The blood is where it is. And I've given it to you to make an atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Uh, finally, after all of that, the, the priest takes all the pieces of the animal, he, ha he, uh, he hands them, puts them on the altar and sets fire to them. And then the worshipper and his family watch until it's all burnt, until it's all consumed. Uh, in other words, atonement, uh, making right for our sins, is a messy, long, involved process. Uh, and before the slaughter takes place, uh, that's why I read that verse, the, the worshipper places their hand on the head of the animal. It's like a symbolic transferring of guilt onto the animal. And so what is atonement? Uh, well, there's two uh, ways in which the original Hebrew word is used. Uh, one is to make something clean. So something was dirty or unclean and it's made clean to atone. The other, and that's the most likely here in this case, is to avoid uh, some kind of punishment by paying a ransom. So in other words, a burnt offering avoids God's anger on the worshipper for their sin and they're spared, if you like, the penalty of their sin and it's transferred onto the animal. A ransom is paid. 
sin is sin is serious. Uh, punishment uh, for our sin before a holy God is a dreaded thing. And if God didn't demand payment for sin, he wouldn't be much of a God at all, would he? I mean, if a judge in our own culture just said, oh, it doesn't matter what you did, just come and get on with it. He wouldn't be a good judge. We wouldn't like him and we wouldn't like our society and how it turned out. Sin is serious before God. Blood atonement is required. Uh, there's lots of examples of burnt offerings in the Old Testament. Um, as this one's from 2 Samuel. Uh, so have in mind this idea of atonement, a ransom paid to avoid God's judgment. So in 2 Samuel, David, that's the king, built an altar to the Lord where, where there and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. We're coming on to that. Then the Lord answered his prayer on behalf of the land and the plague on Israel was stopped. So, so a, a judgment of God was avoided because they made an atonement for their sin through a burnt offering which involved blood. God's wrath was averted. On well, the other side of the coin, this is 2 Chronicles 29. Um, here, the opposite happens. They shut the doors of the portico and put out the lamps. They did not burn incense or present any burnt offerings at the sanctuary of, to God, the God of Israel. Therefore, the anger of the Lord uh, has fallen on Judah and Jerusalem. He has made them an object of dread and horror and scorn, as you can see with your own eyes so burnt offering atonement isn't made and god's wrath is felt they offered no worship or burnt offerings or sacrifices to him in other words if we want to worship god to know the one true god of this world to draw near to god an atoning sacrifice must be brought to avert his anger for he is a holy god and we are not uh, that's the whole point. You, you'll see this repeated phrase, uh, an aroma pleasing to the Lord arising from it. That, that's, that's what we mean by that. It, it pleases God. It's not just that God loves a good barbecue and likes the smell of what's going on. Rather, it's the sacrifice of what's being brought in the right motive and the right way that pleases God. He sees the heart of the worshipper bringing an atonement for their sin because they know they have wronged that they need his mercy. And so his wrath is, is averted. It pleases him and their sin is atoned. So that's the burnt offering, the main one. Uh, let's move on to the second one, the grain offerings. Uh, just as a burnt offering is brought and, it, and it's voluntary, um, you bring it when you feel uh, it's right to do so. So it is with the grain offering. In other words, these first three offerings in fact are all motivated by our heart by our love by our by our um, desire to approach God and worship him and the grain offering is uh, explained as being a way to honor or revere or thank or show allegiance to God so it's a bit different to the first one uh, much like you might give a gift to um, a very important person you're trying to get their business from or uh, to a loved one. You, you present them something good so that they will show favour to you, to thank them, to honour them, to recognise them. Uh, this offering is to be a mixture of grain and olive oil and spices. It could even be baked into a loaf of bread uh, before you take it. We can just take the ingredients pre-mixed. And this is all a fellowship offering. Uh, and it's also important to note, this is what provides food for the priests. If you know... Uh, in the Old Testament, the, the Levites, the priests, weren't entitled to any land, so they relied on sacrificial offerings and their share of that uh, for their lives. Uh, so Leviticus 2, verse 10, uh, the rest of the grain offering belongs to Aaron, that's the, the high priest and his sons. It is the most holy part of the food offering presented to the Lord. Uh, so what's going on? What, how do we get our heads around uh, what a grain offering means and what it might mean for us today? Well, Psalm 96 verse 8 uh, gives us uh, an idea. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. That, that's a sense of what's going on here in the Old Testament. They are ascribing to the Lord the glory due his name. He, he is worthy. And so they come 
and offer him her grain offering. And don't skimp on this offering, he says. Uh, chapter 2, verse 13. Season all your grain offerings with salt. Do not leave the salt of the covenant of your God out of your grain offering. Add salt to all your offerings. Why salt? Well, it tastes better. Uh, but more so at that time, it preserves. Uh, there might be tension. Let's just leave a bit of salt out because it's going to be burnt. Half of it's going to be burnt on the altar. The rest is going to the priest and it all has to be eaten today. That's the rule. So we don't need salt. No, bring your best to the Lord. Not the most, bring your best to the Lord. Don't skimp on your wholehearted worship. I wonder if we think like that today uh, as we bring ourselves to God. Do we bring our best or do we just bring the most to sort of impress other people? Do we bring our best to honor the Lord? So that's the grain offering. Number three, fellowship offerings. Uh, there's some, some debate over this offering, whether it's uh, the idea of fellowship is between us and God uh, or between one another. Uh, it's probably an element of both, but what most seems to be in view here is this element of fellowship or peace with one another. Um, that's because uh, when you bring the offering, it's an animal again, the fat portions, the, the best bit, the richest bits are given and burnt on the altar as a pleasing aroma to God. But the rest is then shared out like a kind of bring and share meal, which we're going to enjoy next week for the coronation. Uh, we won't be burning anything on an altar, don't worry. Um, so Leviticus 7, 14 to 15, this is a little section of instructions to the priests about, about the fellowship offering. They are to bring one of each kind as an offering, a contribution to the Lord. So, um, it belongs to the priest who splashes the blood of the fellowship offering against the altar. The meat of their fellowship offering of thanksgiving must be eaten on the day it is offered. They must leave none of it till morning. In other words, they share in a feast following this offering to show fellowship and love with one another. Uh, we see the action uh, when Saul is made the first king of Israel in 1 Samuel eleven fifteen. 15. Uh, so verses on the screen. So all the people went to Gilgal and made Saul king in the presence of the Lord. There they sacrificed fellowship offerings before the Lord and Saul and all the Israelites held a great celebration. Get the idea of what's going on. Uh, we have peace with God and peace with one another only through sacrifice to the Lord. If we thought about it like that before, we can only have fellowship and peace with one another only through sacrifice given to the Lord. Otherwise, we'd be at war. Uh, the fourth offering mentioned is the sin offering. Uh, these last two offerings are a little bit different. That They're compulsory. In other words, they're to be brought when you become aware of your sin. Uh, the sin offering... Uh, covers slightly different rules and, and, and things going on depending on who has sinned and what the sin is. Uh, there's quite a lot in that chapter. Uh, so whether it's the high priest who sinned, which then affects the whole community or tribal leader or someone just within the general community, uh, there's different sort of rules and regulations going on around that. Uh, what's interesting, though, is that the sin offerings are for, are for all, all for accidental sins, uh, sins of omission. Uh, the people later on realize they have sinned or feel guilty about and so want to make themselves right with God again. Uh, so chapter five, verse one to four lists a few examples of these types of sin. It, it's not a, I don't think it's meant to be an exhaustive list, but we get some examples. So verse one, uh, as an example, says this. If anyone sins because they do not speak up when they hear a public charge to testify regarding something they have seen or learned about, they will be held accountable. So they could have done something, but they didn't. It's like a sin of omission. They should have done it. Uh, it goes on to mention uh, touching an unclean animal or, or someone who is bleeding or someone with a skin disease or, or failing to fulfill an oath that you have made. The point is that all of us will find we have sinned against God very often without even realizing it or meaning to. But sin it still is according to these offerings. It's very tempting today to think that we're, we're saved by Jesus, so we don't really sin anymore. But the Bible is clear. We are dep depraved. Uh, our righteousness before God is in Christ alone, this once-for-all sacrifice that we're coming to. We have the Spirit now to help us not to sin, but even our righteous acts are like 
filthy rags before God. We need a blood sacrifice simply for being human. We are human and therefore we need a blood sacrifice so that we can be acceptable to God. Uh, this offering, uh, unlike the burnt offering, the main one, uh, doesn't deal with our atonement by paying the price for a, a judgment. I think you'd still need a burnt offering in those days uh, to pay that price, to be atoned in that sense. This offering, as you read it through, you see, makes us clean again. It, it sort of takes the impurities away from our situation. It, it makes us clean from our sort of natural, daily, often unintended failures. It, it changes us from what we are, unclean, filthy rags, to clean, righteous before God. Uh, why do they need this offering? Why can't they just be atoned from God's wrath? Well, because if you know the context of Leviticus, we thought about it last week, God has been speaking to Moses on the mountain. Moses is told to build a tent for God to come and dwell or at least represent his dwelling amongst his people at the foot of the mountain. He does that at the end of Exodus. And then uh, God comes down and dwells with his people, a holy, pure, clean God with his people. And he cannot live there if the people are unclean. So even from their unintended, their natural human state, they must be clean. And that's what this uh, offering seems to be about. Um, it's important to note that as you read through this, uh, we, ha we won't look at it in detail now, but uh, the idea of being unclean is not the same as being sinful. Uh, sin can make you unclean, absolutely, but very normal things make us unclean, uh, such as childbirth or skin diseases. Uh, those things aren't sinful, but to be in the presence of a holy, pure and clean God means that we need to be cleansed of all those things that are, if you like, a result of the fall, where humanity turned against God and Adam took the first fruit and, sin, and, and sinned. So lots of the things from the fall are not sinful in and of themselves, but they're not intended to be in God's eternal paradise with him. We won't have blood or skin diseases uh, for, in, in eternity. Sorry, we might have blood, but we won't be uh, bleeding. They're not intended to be in this prayer, so we need to be made clean from them. And so this offering is a way of cleaning ourselves from our natural state, without which we remain di dirty and in a fallen world for God. I wonder if we pray and think about our, our cleansing and what's required to make us right and clean before God today. Uh, Interestingly, the word unintentional sin, which comes up a few times, comes from the root word meaning to wander off like a lost sheep. Uh, maybe you know the common book of prayer, prayer. Uh, many of the, you would have uh, read it growing up. Um, it says this, we have erred and strayed from our ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have left undone those things that we ought to have done and we have done those things that we ought not to have done we need cleansing made, made clean again from our natural state so that we can be in the presence of a holy god very finally the last offering uh, um, very briefly this one uh, a guilt offering uh, th this is relevant to sin that affects our relationships with other people. So as you read it through it, you'll, you'll see this need to repay people for things we've done wrong. It, it could be towards God. It could be towards the priest. You, you might have eat, eaten the food laid aside for the priests. Uh, you might have damaged or, or stolen or, or borrowed and broken uh, someone else's property. Uh, but the basic principles of sacrifice are the same as all the others. Uh, and the purpose is to be made right with God and with your neighbor again. The difference with this sacrifice is that there is a repayment required. Uh, so you repay what you have taken or what you have broken or, or the way in which you've wronged another party. You don't just repay them, you add a fifth to that value as well. So God's people should love God and one another rightly. And sacrifice and repayment, says this offering, is required when we don't. Even our uh, relationships with each other rely on a sacrifice before God to be right in his sight. So what do we learn from all this? 
uh, for ourselves. Uh, well, our last uh, two points, they're much shorter than those. Number one, Jesus is our offering or offerings to God. Uh, back to Hebrews verse three to seven. Uh, why don't we do all these sacrifices today? We've thought about it already. What's going on in Jesus? Well, verse three says this of Hebrews 10. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offerings you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased because they, they didn't actually affect anything. Then I said, here I am. It, uh, it is written about me in the scrolls. I have come to do your will, my God. In other words, Jesus fulfills all of the Old Testament offerings required, all of them. All he did on the cross for us cannot be summed up in, in one little offering in the Old Testament. So God gave a whole book of offerings, seven, in, uh, sorry, five uh, offerings in total, all that point towards the Lord Jesus and his one offerings. And so Jesus says, you see all of that? All of that mess that needs making right and clean and atoned before God, I am here, he says. Here I am. I am the sacrifice and the repayment plus that is owed to God and others. And I'm going to do it all on your behalf, he says. Those burnt offerings, I'm the one whose blood will truly atone because I'm fully human. He is our atonement, taking that wrath of God that is owed. He is our ransom so that we don't have to face it. He is the one that shows God true thankfulness and allegiance and honor. He is that offering, the grain offering. He is the fellowship offering. Through him, we are able to gather as one family. And we too gather around a table and share a meal when we share the Lord's Supper, don't we? After his sacrifice is the fellowship offering. He is the sin offering, purifying us from the fall of humanity, from our natural state, purifying us from pain and disease that one day will all go when he returns. Purifying us from our unintended sinfulness and our wickedness and our hearts. He's the sin offering. And finally, he's the guilt offering. He, he repays God the Father fully. And then he adds a fifth. He repays one another so that we can love and forgive one another because Christ has done it all for us. And he adds a fifth. Jesus is the all in all sacrifice for us before God. So Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He atones. Romans 3.25, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by us in faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished in other words we needed part two there is one holy god who demands an atoning sacrifice so that his people can be holy if you're not repenting and believing in jesus well you need to because no amount of sacrifices or offerings are going to do it other than the lord jesus and we will face his consequences and number two our life is now an offering to God. If we have accepted that Jesus is our once for all sacrifice, achieving all that we could not, then our life is now an offering to God in response. Uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2. I think Nigel's going to pray uh, around these verses after the sermon. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, so in view of the Lord Jesus, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing the aroma to God. This is your true and proper worship, our approach to him, draw near. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Having been atoned by Jesus fully, we now belong to him and our whole lives become a, a living sacrifice, 
to the Lord. Not to save ourselves, not to atone ourselves. That's all done. We do it because Jesus did it. I don't know if we wake up every day and read God's word and pray as, as a living sacrifice. Whether we daily think about him in our decisions. Whether we spend our money with thankfulness and tithing. Whether we talk to those around us about the gospel of Jesus. Whether we feel a guilt of our sin unintended or not, and repent before him again, whether we live every minute to please our saviour, whether we love our neighbours as ourselves, or when we don't do that, come again to the once for all sacrifice. Once again, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice to him, <laughs> wholehearted, minute by minute, drawing near worship of God is what is needed, because Jesus has done it all. A few verses to finish. I love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength. I love your neighbor as yourself. These are more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. Ephesians 5 2 Live to live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Hebrews 13, 16, and do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Let me pray. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, you are a holy and awesome God to whom we cannot approach without the Lord Jesus as our atoning sacrifice. Forgive us for all that we have done wrong against you, intentionally or unintentionally. Make us clean again. Free us from guilt. Accept the Lord Jesus' blood in our place. And may we offer our lives as a living sacrifice to you, desiring to worship you, draw near. Give us strength to do such. And show us the Lord Jesus again and all that he has done for us, for fulfilling all of those offerings and sacrifices in our place, so that your name may be glorified above all and always instead of us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.